Hello, everyone. Okay, so welcome to the Hangout with Christy Winters and Tom Avella. Mostly going to be talking about politics and social issues and whatnot, but this is going to be a pretty, pretty freewheeling chat, and um, it'll go. It's oh crap! I'm I'm hearing myself. Hold on a sec. We just started the stream. Yep. <laughs> that that or that always happens. Somebody always yeah. gets to mute the, the stream. I don't even know why I have it open because I don't do chats anymore. I chat um, windows on my Hangouts anymore. <laughs> mm. uh, anyway, that aside, you guys want to say hi? Well, hello, everyone. What's going on? Uh, so, where should we start? Um, maybe we'll talk about the uh, recent developments in the American election. Oh, yes, think. what fun. Which <laughs> right? would, those, would those be? Exactly, there's so many. Uh, yeah, well, that's true. It's a very, it's a ridiculous election. With, if, you, if you went back in time to basically any previous election, even 2012, and told people what this one was like, they, I don't think they would believe you. It feels like a sitcom. Yeah. Yeah. It feels, like, it feels more like survival. Like it was written by like, a team of writers behind like the Big Bang Theory or something. <laughs> Just the most I definitely improbable. agree that it feels like a reality TV show. I think it's, yeah, and, and like, you know, like there's two contestants and only one will win the whatever the fuck it is, seven week holiday. Yeah. And, yeah. <laughs> we'll go home Maybe with the bachelor of, or whatever. Sort of a cross <laughs> between the running man and the West Wing. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Did you know that Trump has floated the idea of doing um, The Apprentice in the White House? Oh, my God. <laughs> oh, I swear, I think I he have. just, you know, he, he wants to build a wall to get the building contracts, and he wants to get all of the um, oil out of Saudi Arabia and, like, rebuild the Middle East with all of his own companies. I think that's his master plan. Well, I personally don't think he even intends to build a wall um, because it would be crazily expensive compared to what I every single... Uh, estimate he's floated and i just don't think he actually has really looked into it like he intends to do it i think the theory that it's all about starting a right-wing media company to compete with fox news is really what it's about um that you know that theory that's been floated based on the people from the alt-right and um roger ailes that he has picked up and they seem to be like uh what was that he went to a state he has no chance to win and did a massive like twenty thousand person um, rally was it in in, in um, Washington State where he just well he also was anywhere. in Mississippi which is another pointless state to be rallying in yeah um, well, so exactly that, yeah he t he seems to be doing um, a lot of work in non swing states and the the theory is is that he's just trying to build up a base for a future company um, to compete that's basically the the alt right version of Fox News. And now he's got Roger Ailes in his back pocket. Exactly, and Stephen Bannon, you know. It's, 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 it's amazing kinda, to me because these people seem to be more intent on attacking the right than they do on actually winning elections. And it's like the Tea Party, you know. But he, he doesn't really yeah. seem like he wants to win. Uh, maybe recently he's done a bit of stuff to walk back some more, more of the terrible things he's said and whatnot. But he doesn't seem like he's trying to win to me. I kind of knew it would just be like a way for him. What? <laughs> yeah, go ahead. I was going like, to defer to right, you sorry. before I said something. I knew that this was just going to be like a way for him to increase his brand like from the beginning. But I think everybody was just like, oh, he can't win. He, this is just a stunt. And now look how far he's going. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, well, you know, Michael Moore had that theory that um, the whole reason he originally threw his head in was as a bargaining chip in his in, in his negotiations with um, who was it that that hosts The Apprentice, NBC or whoever it is. NBC, yeah. Yeah, yeah, and then the whole thing backfired because they cancelled mm. the show because of his insane rhetoric. Uh, I don't well, know if that's it's true. Kind of, I, I, what I find ridiculous when you think about it is that the thing that drives that part of the Republican Party is their anger at the establishment. These guys say things and they don't really mean it. And yet, yeah. you know, Donald Trump says stuff tandem, you know, but then you say to them, well, what do you think about him actually building a wall across Mexico? And they go, well, he doesn't really mean it. Well, is <laughs> yeah. that what the yeah. problem is with establishment politicians as well? I mean, he isn't mm -hmm. saying what he means when he changes his mind on a topic five times. 
then yeah. how is it any different than the politicians that you're mad at? And that actually, that brings me to another thing I wanted to it, talk about. Oh, sorry. No, go, Tom. Yeah. How is it any different from all the other promises that all these other presidential candidates have made throughout out the course of history? Like George H.W. Bush, read my lips, no new taxes, whole shit ton of new taxes. You know? Yeah, no. And they like, all did that. He is yeah. just a regular politician, except he's not as savvy. And I, I think the, the is, yeah. Yeah, I, I think the real difference is the sort of um, alarming nature of his rhetoric. You know, the things he says and then contradicts over and over again, back and forth, are just um, more outlandish and more um, extreme than what any of the other candidates are saying, Ex with the exception of Ted Cruz and like Louis Gohmert and a few of the really, really yeah. out there ones. But I think it's important to remember that all of that, that Trump rhetoric is taking place within a wider Breitbart world where mm -hmm. being aggressively offensive to people and trying to marginalize groups that are trying to get equality, um, that fight back now, the sort of anti-civil rights, as it were, um, yeah. is feeding the Trump thing on that, but he's just doing it on a much larger stage. They're doing it on Twitter and on websites and he's doing it, you know, as a presidential candidate. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and mm -hmm. it's it's interesting because if you look at like Breitbart and you know Bannon and other and Bannon and the people he's surrounding himself with, the, the sorts of things they've said about other people on the right who are far on the right who just don't happen to have the exact same ideology as them. But I, I think that one of the worst things Breitbart ever did was what they called Bill Crystal, you know, neocon primary neocon strategist. They called him a renegade Jew, which vile. That's, that rough. Is, That's really rough. When, when people are making you take Bill Crystal's side, I mean, that yeah. is way out there. But Bill Crystal was the kind of guy who, in 2000, like when I was in my 20s during the uh, Bush administration, I thought, you know, that these people were the worst right the right could, could, you know, provide in a mainstream sense in American politics. But boy, was I wrong. These people make neocons look like Bertrand Russell, you know. It's amazing. Mm -hmm. Isn't there a quote something about like revolutions, you know, sort of eat their own children? There's always a new generation coming up that's more, you know, far, more, you know, not always, but there can be people moving farther and farther to the right here. And I, these ideological purity tests mean that previous conservatives are just being chewed up and thrown out. Yeah. And, and the whole um, Southern strategy, um, the whole um, value voter thing has really backfired on the Republic. I think that they used as a tool to gain voters is now basically controlling them. Mm. And also, it just seems to me too that evangelicals would have a really good case to call Trump the Antichrist. Yeah. You know, the way that they fit the, the narrative that, to get so many people, <laughs> they could have fit it to him. The one that amazes me the most was Phyllis Schlafly. She oh, started yeah. the whole slow trend towards what we've got now. Uh, by endorsing mm -hmm. Barry Goldwater and um, denouncing uh, and condemning, uh, who was Barry Goldwater's opponent? Oh God, one of the, one of the oligarchs, not Rockefeller, the other Dupont or whatever. One, one of the of fucking, them. yeah, what, yeah, one of the major fucking billionaires at the time, who was like the establishment candidate, and then Goldwater came in and he won because people like Phyllis Schlafly attacked the other guy for have it, for getting a divorce. That was the whole thing, is he got a divorce. And that was not acceptable to the Christian right. Then she, by the end of her life, she's endorsing Trump, who's on his third marriage. Like, it makes no sense at all. It's totally hypocritical. And she, she really destroyed her. Because, you know, as much as I despise people like her, at least they stood for something and had a set of values. But she totally just gave that up. She totally corrupted that, you know, by the end. Just because, uh, uh, just because she's a right-wing authoritarian, and that's what right-wing authoritarians do. Whoever is the big dog is who they kowtow to. Well said. Is I all can't I can say I about. had much. Every time, I can't say I had much sympathy for like you know her. I try not to celebrate people's deaths too much, but that was one where I was just like, I'm not really gonna miss you that much, am I? <laughs> no, <laughs> as awful as that is to say, I mean, yeah. you know, it's okay. It's okay. So I actually would have had a lot more respect for her if she hadn't endorsed Trump mm -hmm. because that, she just sold out everything that she apparently stood for. But yeah, yeah, I wanted like, to bring like, up stand by what you believe in, man. Yeah. Even if it is horrible, you know, mm -hmm. at least be consistent. 
You know, if you're not consistent, how do you even approach dealing with someone like that? Like with Trump, how do you debate Trump? Because he's, he can always just say, oh, no, I said the opposite of what you're saying, because he says both positions on every issue. You know, like the nuclear um, power, the nuclear weapons thing. He can say, no, look, in this specific clip, I directly said I would never use them. But then like 10 seconds later in that same interview, he's like, maybe I'll use them. You know, yeah. so. PolitiFact has had a field day with all the shit he said. Oh, yeah. <laughs> The interesting thing about Trump is that he is separating out the party people from the con principled people. Mm, and there mm. are some people who on principle cannot support him. And then there are people like Paul Ryan who say that he is, says racist things. And, you know, he does, he apologizes for him and says he thinks he should release his taxes. And yet we'll stand by this man who said yeah. racist things and yeah. say he should be president. It's amazing. I don't know who made this. Maybe it was the Young Turks or it'd be someone else probably. Somebody put together a video. Um, might have been one of the late night shows like Colbert. But anyway, someone put together a video that was all clips of um, prominent Republicans denouncing him in various ways, followed by a clip of them endorsing him. And it is, um, it's an amazing watch. It might have been um, Seth Meyers, actually, who made that. Mm. Um, and it was like the I know worst. Go on, sorry. Uh, Col Colbert actually put together a whole um, segment where it was just um, like Trump saying a thing and then saying the exact opposite. Yeah. It was a thing he yeah. like staged yeah. into two Trumps. I, I think the worst one was Chris Christie because the stuff he was saying about Trump was very accurate and very fair, but very strong in condemnation. Like he would go after him for basically everything. He, was, he did one speech, which was like 20 minutes long, of just attacking Trump in every possible way you could imagine. And then he's endorsing him and acting like his lapdog. It's just embarrassing. You know? mm -hmm. Running out and buying a McDonald's and shit. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Getting his coffee. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. But yeah, um, another person I wanted to talk about is Jill Stein. Because, Ooh. man, this, I don't understand. I mean, I guess I do because a lot of people in any political group are going to be quite ignorant and uninformed. But progressives who are... Uh, endorsing who are supporting her that does not make any sense she is not a progressive she is an old she's on the alt left is what i call it you know um anti-science conspiracy theories 9 11 truthers, oh, yeah. anti-gmo anti-vaccine and you know people will link to a page on her website where she's like i'm not any of those things it's as if politicians don't lie about negative things about themselves of course she's gonna say she's not that she's trying to get bernie voters wi-fi signals yeah, yeah, exactly. exactly. Wi-Fi signals are dangerous, guys. Did you know? Yeah, yeah. All these dog whistles about having more investigation into things that have been thoroughly, thoroughly investigated, like 9-11. Oh, yeah, the 9-11 yeah, thing that just happened. Yeah, she said we need more investigation into 9-11. She said me. more investigation into vaccines. Vaccines are one of the most studied things, like, ever. Mm. There are so many. There's thousands. I remember seeing a thing where it was, like, 6,400 different studies on them over the course of decades. Yeah, like, man... It's just, yeah, it's dog whistles. And it's like, you know, it's the same as Trump. You know, he'll say one thing publicly so that Trump supporters can point to that and go, he's not what you're saying because he said this. But then, yeah, you look at his dog whistles and it's all in, it's all in there. Yeah, whether it's a moratorium on GMOs or a moratorium, I mean, I mean, one might be a bit more grave than the other, but they're still not really, they're both bad ideas, even mm. if one is better than the other. Yeah, yeah. And it, it amazes me because, you know, the... If you look at what progressivism is supposed to be as an ideology, you know, you've got your um, economic side uh, wanting to decrease the wealth gap and use economic growth to support them and grow the middle class. You've got um, support of <coughs> social issues and um, social justice, that kind of stuff. But another really important part is pro-science, using science and mm. technology um, government funding of science and technology projects um, over long period, long term funding of scientific and technological projects, and championing those things as a way to make human life better. And by opposing GMOs, you are basically standing directly in the way of that because there's third world mm. countries with not enough arable land who can only grow GMO crops. And so when you try and interfere with that, you're being a piece of shit. Basically. Yeah. That's putting it light. Like, it's all well and good for people in the West to have, you know, concerns about themselves eating GMOs because we've got so much food. But there's people mm -hmm. around the world who don't have that. And, who, and any way we can get them more food is a good thing, you know? Yeah. One of those... I think that... Um, go ahead, Tom, Yeah, uh, there is a... 
the um there it's like somebody's just like what was it something about like during the potato famine it was like oh i wish we could grow potatoes that didn't go bad and then and like technology and it's like oh this is evil and uh it's manufa it's chemicals even yeah. though everything's chemicals <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> yeah, better not drink any water. That's full of chemicals. It's like one hundred percent chemicals. Di hydrogen monoxide. It's bad. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I think the Green Party would be much better off instead of you know having Jill Stein as their candidate to focus on a state like California, where Democrats basically dominate, and start to uh, organize locally to get people elected to the state legislature. I mean, it's a massive economy. And you've got a lot of progressive people there who can then help move the policies even farther to the left than the, the Democrats. And, you know, maybe start to look to replace the Republicans um, in terms of the swing party, you know, for, for votes and things. Right. And then yeah, you can yeah. see so, some, and your technology emphasis as well would go down really well in California. Totally. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So you're, you're saying like a two party system, but with the Greens as the other party yeah. in California. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah that makes sense. I think um, I mean, that would be the obvious place to make that kind of political effort. It's tricky in the States because you have, a, you know, you guys still use first past the post. Whereas in New Zealand, where we have MMP, basically, if you get over 5% of the votes, you get a certain number of seats in parliament and you have a, a proportional representational say in things. So like the Greens, for example, in New Zealand have been in the government for, since forever that I can remember since the 90s or whenever the Greens started. They took a couple of uh, rounds of elections to get up to over 5%. And ever since then, they've been consistently in there. And they released like, lists of legislation that they had the deciding vote on. Uh, there was um, a bunch of stuff to do with plastics and stuff like that that they, they had the deciding vote on that was quite important. So, yeah, when you're in a system like America has, it, it's really difficult for those um, smaller yet crucially important parties to have a say. I wouldn't want the Greens to be running my country because they're a little bit too... Oh, lefty for me, but um, they definitely should have a place. Any, any pa a party that focuses on climate change needs to have a place. Yeah, you know. you're talking about five or maybe 10 seats would be enough to sway that in a state legislature. Yeah, so. yeah. They're a bit of a hard sell over here in the state, though, because I think the party, like, their platform is officially like eco socialism now, and that's like socialism has always been a hard sell here. Yeah, yeah. That, that's always been. A dirty yeah. word in McCarthy. Because of, because of that American um, political vernacular shorthand of using socialist to mean social democracy. Mm. Mm -hmm. Like well, a or socialism to the civilized world. <laughs> there might be some pretty, you know, progressive places around Berkeley or something where some dedicated Sanders people could, you know, organize and pull a few seats out, you know, if they, you know, took that enthusiasm that you saw during the primary. Yeah, he would have to go the third party route to do that, though, and he doesn't want to do that because of Trump, which I get, you know. No, no, but I mean, on the local level, to organize, you know, shape the local Green Party. Shape right. The oh, right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. Greens. But then you see, I don't know, because even though I disagree with a lot of the stuff the Greens say, I don't want to change their platform because the people who do support them deserve to have a voice and deserve to have a party they can support. So I don't know if I necessarily feel comfortable well, with. But Democrats, in, Democrats in Texas support gun rights in ways that Democrats in other states don't. I mean, you can have a state party platform. Yep. You know? yep. So they have that flexibility. Mm, mm. I think what, what I would want to focus on is, is trying to somehow get the Democrats back into progressivism again and, and abandon the third way. But it's going to be tricky because it has been economically a very successful ideology, you know. Mm. And the whole Reagan incident did push American discourse so far to the right that I don't even know if it's feasible anymore. And that, by the way, had an effect around the whole Western world. So thank you for that. Although yeah, the UK no problem. Just is to blame. <laughs> I, am, yeah, I, am I was saying um, to one of my um, friends the other day that, well, yesterday that uh, New Zealand actually went further with the um, Reaganomics trickle down bullshit than either the US or the UK did. Um, that is often how New Zealand is. We're like a little test case for political ideas, and we often like take things really far so that other countries can see what that would be like. Like, um, <laughs> what was that? Like the extreme guy? case. So, well, yeah, no, we are. We get cited a lot. Yeah, like um, Br Britain has been using us like that for a long time, you know, uh, and other countries in the British Empire too for various things. But New Zealand has been. For example, there we'll was be the guinea pig. We'll be the guinea pigs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, 
man I just, yeah we 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 have we're still suffering from what we call rogernomics because that was the guy who um put them in place here who was a guy on the left by the way not a right-wing guy um yeah and there has not we don't have a bernie we don't have a corbyn there's nobody like that here the, the third way totally controls the left-wing party they have just have absolute control of it and they're weak as hell um, and can't really pose a threat to the right you know we've had right-wingers in charge for eight years and they don't look like they're going anywhere, which is horrible. But yeah. So yes, people in my country feel the whole uh, after effects of that era to this day quite strongly. The magic of the free market. <laughs> I know, right? Yeah, like for, exa for example, um, in New Zealand during that time, and maybe not still to this day, we would never bail do the big bailouts that happen in the recession because that goes against free market capitalism, right? To do a bail, massive bailout, that, that's not the free market. That's government intervention. And um, when you actually do um, adhere to free market principles, you wouldn't condone something like a, a big bailout. That's not how free market capitalism works. And so that would not mm -hmm. actually happen here. Yeah, we all know how well that worked out when they did that with Lehman Brothers, right? <laughs> yeah. The free market. It's a faith-based system. It's why it appeals so well to you know the whole Christian conservative movement because it also requires blind faith in something that yeah. you know um, constantly lets you down. <laughs> yeah, and actually, yeah, it's worse. It's worse, really, than than religion because at least with religion, you never know either way. Whereas you can totally document how fucking dangerous Wall Street is and how much, how exactly. many times and how much they've fucked the people over. Yeah. Like, and yet they still the, believe. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. The term, the term market fundamentalists exists for a reason. Like it is yeah. like fundamentalist principles <laughs> of dogmaticism and all that. What was that recent, I don't know what state it was. There was that guy who decided to put in place like the pure free market rules and he eliminated income tax on small businesses. And he was like, this is going to be great. And then it tanked. And then he managed to get reelected by saying it just, we didn't have long enough. Do you remember who Brownback that was? In, was that Brownback in Kansas? Cause he yeah. tried something yeah. similar. Sam Brownback. Yeah. That guy, that is, that is market fundamentalism right there because he oh, tried yeah. a thing. It obviously didn't work the way he said it would, which was entirely predictable if he'd been listening to the right people, which he wasn't. Then he just kept thinking it was going to work and it just obviously wasn't. The evidence was right in front of his mm -hmm. face and he just was like, nope, it's yeah. going to work. I was just thinking about this actually earlier today because we are talking about the having this, this chat and going over some things in my mind. But um, I remember someone pointing out once, you know, that the Constitution talks about the pursuing life, liberty, and happiness. But when Locke wrote it, it was property. And when the, when the founding fathers built the government, it was built on an assumption of what the economy was, which was an agrarian economy, right? The only people who had any political power were white property men over the age of 30. And they just had the right to vote, but you had a sort of a political elite that was in operation. Um, very you know, men who had slaves, they could afford to have, have slaves. And the, in that world, you had a lot of people who were self sustaining. They grew their own food, they bartered with their neighbors, and there was some limited trade, right? And that yeah. was where the idea of small government came from. Because if you had property, then you didn't need a big government. But yeah. what people who are conservative don't realize is that fundamental third pillar of this you know, the economy in terms of you know, the political and the social has changed too and now we have a capitalist economy where people aren't self-sustaining and they basically you know they just talk about being you know wage slaves but we have capital as the basis of our economy and that leaves people very vulnerable and we need ways to redistribute the wealth of the nation so that all of its citizens prosper it's not a, a place where people should come in from international companies, suck the wealth out, and move it into private Swiss accounts. That's robbery. Um, so we need to think about the ways that our nations produce wealth and also think about the ways that everybody enjoys it because we can't go back to the agrarian way that was the principles that conservatives preach about so often. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And I would, I would also say that I don't, not many people seem to know this, but... Um, America, when it was originally set up, there was a whole other part to the, found, the foundation and the, the way that American society was originally set up, which was anti-corporatism. They hated the big corporations. Because another thing most people don't realize is the biggest corporations in history existed hundreds of years ago, not now. The biggest corporation in history was the British East India Company, which was the most powerful and largest in terms of manpower. 
well, they were basically an empire. They were a massive wing of the British Empire. They had armies, multiple armies. They conducted wars and, and all kinds of stuff, genocides. And the Americans hated that and wanted to curb corporate power as drastically as possible. And that's one of the reasons why um, the state system was really important because they could do things like um, limit uh, corporate activity to one state. You weren't allowed to do a multi-state, interstate um, activities. And that all got abolished over the years by a series of very savvy corporate lawyers. But, um, you know, on the, for railroad barons and stuff. But, but yeah, like um, America was supposed to be fundamentally an anti-corporate society. And looking at it now, we would just be like, whoa, holy crap. The, the founding fathers would hate what America has become. Hate it. Yeah. I mean, they probably hate Washington in his resignation. <laughs> they probably hate it though, because because, like, like people are free and stuff as well. But anyway, <laughs> oh yeah, that too, that too. But like George Washington in his resignation address is like, don't form political parties, guys. Don't do any of these things that I have to do. And then we did all those things. Like, mm. <laughs> and he's probably spinning in his grave right now, thinking about like what, like what happened. It's happened to us. Yeah, yeah. 